very much appreciate your presence tonight. Those that are visiting with us, we want to welcome you and hope you feel welcome and we'll come back any and every opportunity you have. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 John, 1 John. John writes his letters right before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And you can tell that by some of the content of the book. Among the things that Jesus said would happen before the fall of Jerusalem would be that the love of many would wax cold. And he's talking about the love that brethren would have for each other. That there would be such trying circumstances and lots of false teachers that would uh, undermine the need to stay steady and strong in the faith. There would be those who would uh, tickle the ears with messages that promised them that they would have salvation without sacrifice, without having to stand up for anything, especially confessing Jesus and being true to His Word under those trying circumstances. So John writes to tell us that there are standards, there are things that we have to do. And we must keep our, our faith and our commitment in check. And it is a wonderful book that challenges those brethren then, it challenged them then, and challenges us now. And so I hope that we'll look very closely, not just at the book, but at how this applies to us in particular. Sometimes we can see in ourselves, I know I do, and I'm sure you would say the same, that the, what, the, the, there is sometimes a difference between what I believe and what I do. And Paul had that struggle himself. We studied this morning in one of the classes about the struggle Paul had in knowing what was right and then him not doing the things that he knew he needed to do. John is not excusing that, but he is admitting that problem even in himself. And so there is a contradiction Sometimes between what we profess to believe and what we are actually doing. Now that's not good and it's not excused on the basis that Paul had that struggle. It's not excused on the basis that John had that struggle. In fact, he's calling it to our attention so that the difference between the profession and the action can come closer together. And that's very, very important. It's very essential In fact, it's necessary that we bring into line with what we profess to believe the actions that show that that faith is actually alive. It's actually moving us. It's actually motivating us. It's actually causing reactions to take place. It's causing a stir within us and it's causing us to keep examining ourselves and keep trying to make adjustments between the profession of what we believe versus the actions that people see and we sometimes see in ourselves. So we're going to look at 1 John with the challenge that John places before his readers and we understand that we're involved with that challenge as well. As is the pattern that you see in the Gospel of John. John likes to deal with numbers and he likes to use the number 7 And this seems to be one of his sevens. There are seven contradictions between what a person says he believes or says is true of himself versus what he's actually doing. So let's look at them. What is said? Several things are in this book in regard to what one says. And the first one I want you to notice is down in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, if we say, here's something we profess, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, that is with God, don't you say that? I say that I have fellowship with God. We all must say that. I mean, we must not, it is not a game. We're not trying to play a game. We must be serious that we're here because we're wanting to have fellowship with God. 
And we want to build that partnership, that communion, that establish that as a reality, not something that we just talk about. But, but if we say that, and we must say that, if we can't say it, then something is really wrong. If we don't want to say it, there's something wrong with that picture too. And so it is something that is essential that we be able to say that we have fellowship with God. And each one of us has got to say, I have established fellowship, partnership with God, and I'm not going to lose that. I don't want to lose that. And so we want to make sure that we can say that, that we have partnership, fellowship with God. But now he says, now here's the problem though. Because if we say that and walk in darkness, and so there's the difference Sometimes we can say it, but the way that we live doesn't match that profession. You see, when you're saying you have partnership with God, you're saying you have a a communion, a partnership with a holy God. And he's, He's fine with that. And you're fine with that. So we have fellowship with God. But he says, but if you're if you walk in darkness. You can say you have fellowship, and that would be a lie. So we must not be lying about it. We must have fellowship with Him, and we must be able to say that, that we have fellowship with God. So let's make sure, brethren, that every one of us can say, and you say that in regard to yourself, and I'll work on that myself, that we have established a relationship a fellowship, a partnership with God. But that demands something of us. I mean, you can't just make the claim and then nothing changes. If there is that partnership, I want you to notice, holding your place there, that there is something transforming about that. I mean, you you cannot remain the same. So I'm turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want you to notice with me 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look down at verse 18. Verse 18. He says, We all, but we all, that's us, all of us Christians, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, The glory of the Lord, we're looking at that, and and of course according to John, we can say we have established fellowship with this glorious Lord. What happens is then, is that we are being, so it's a process, it started and it's happening, and it's going on, it keeps going on. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, meaning one stage of development of glory to the next, we're becoming more and more like Him. So we can't just make a claim that we've established fellowship and everything remains the same. Never, never again will we be the same if we've established fellowship, partnership with God. Now, if we, have, if we claim that we have fellowship, then he says, you cannot walk in darkness. Now, that term walk doesn't mean you step off the path and then you get back on. We're talking about taking a course of action where you are in movement, in progress, that you're moving away from the light, not walking in the light. The progress, the process of moving away from the the light means here's something God says, and I just turn that off. I just turn that out. I tune out. I'm not going to accept that, even though God said that. The holy God said that. And then we say, I'm not going to do that. If you do that, then you're not going to be walking in the light anymore. So you cannot dismiss anything that God says. Now, with that in mind, holding your place there in 1 John, let's look at another passage. This time I'm looking at 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 6, verse, starting with verse 8. He says, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 8. No, you yourselves, he's writing to Christians now. You yourselves do wrong and defraud. And you do these things to your brethren. And then he says in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? I'm talking to you, brethren. John, uh, Paul is writing to the brethren. And he's saying, don't you know this? Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he says, do not be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. So it's possible that some of these brethren could take one another to law and kind of dismiss whether that's right or not and whether that's the thing they ought to do and whether that's what God wants them to do. And they can kind of tune that out and say, I'm going to do it anyway because uh, he did me wrong. He says, don't deceive yourself. Fornicators, don't deceive yourself. If you're committing fornication, don't deceive yourself. That is not activity that allows you to to continue that course of action and have the grace of God. It doesn't work that way. Do not be deceived. Now you can do that. You can deceive yourself. Just like a person can say, we ha- I have fellowship with God. And then he's committing fornication. Don't deceive yourself. Nor idolaters. That would be inclusive of that would be those who are materialistic. Adulterers. Don't deceive yourself. Homosexuals, don't deceive yourselves. Sodomites, don't deceive yourself. You cannot walk in fellowship with God. Thieves, you steal, you steal from the boss, you steal from people, don't deceive yourself. Covetous, Drunkards, don't deceive yourself. More and more brethren are deceiving themselves on that point these days. Don't deceive yourself. Revilers, extortioners, listen, you cannot have fellowship with God and practice any of these things. That's walking in the dark. And he says, you cannot have fellowship with God and inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot. It will not happen. It is self-deception. And so he says in this passage, it just doesn't work out. Really, that's the mentality that we're hearing today of the, uh, of the grace that is supposed to allow you to believe with such assurance that once you are saved, you don't have to worry about it. It has all been done for you. Jesus did it all. And that's supposed to give people some kind of assurance that they can continue the practice of any of these sins and still go to heaven. And he says that's self-deception. And you can do that on many different levels. But in particular, I'm thinking that when a person's lifestyle does not line up with the claim that you're walking in partnership with a holy God, that the holiness of God will burn that out of you. It will make you feel guilty until you give it up or you admit You do not have fellowship with him. So we need both. We need to be able to say we have fellowship with God. And we also need to align our walk so that it looks like we have partnership with God. We need both of those things. And it must not be that our profession is one thing and our 
Action just simply doesn't look like partnership and fellowship with God at all. You see, what is said and what is done has got to start moving in the same direction. Another thing along this line, there are two possibilities when a person might say the next thing. And I'm looking now at verse 8. If we say, we have no sin, even at a young age, even as a teenager, I knew enough about the Bible to know that you never make that claim. And To my surprise, there are people still today who will say that. I don't have any sin. And what John was writing about in this particular case was a case where somebody might actually say that and they might actually believe it. But he says, and he's including himself, and so I... I can find comfort in the fact that I'm not by myself. And that when John says, if we, we Christians, if we say that we have no sin. You remember uh, the book of Ecclesiastes writes to the effect that, that a person can be righteous. But he's, he, he can't make the claim that he never sins. So, you can be righteous, but it's not a perfect righteousness all the time. So, if a person thinks he has no sin, there are two possibilities. Number one, he believes that sin is not accounted to them. Now, that's the basis of once saved, always saved. Is that they believe that the Lord looks at them... And instead of seeing them with all their sin, it's kind of like God just kind of placed Jesus over that. And all God is seeing is Jesus. That's the argument that they make for that particular doctrine. They they believe that sin is never accounted to them ever again. No matter what they do, God is not going to count it against you. And so they believe that once you're saved, you are always saved. But John says right here, That's self-deception. The second possibility, if you don't believe that uh, the first thing, that sin is just not accounted to you, even though you might personally sin, but it's not counted against you, you might believe that you live above it, that you're, you're perfect. Now, I don't believe either one of those. So, I believe that there's a third possibility And the third possibility is that God does count sin when I sin. He does count it. But there's a way to handle that. And the way God handles it is not to pretend that it's not there. And to say, I'm not going to see that. I'm just going to see Jesus from now on. God's not going to play games like that. He he doesn't do that. There is no biblical... Now, there is a passage in Roman that talks about... The fact that uh, sin is not accounted to you. Why? Because you've been forgiven. All right? So, if you're forgiven, then then what you've done in the past is not counted against you anymore. All right? Now, I can agree with that. That's what the Bible does teach. But to say that we have no sin means that there's a serious problem. And that is that we must not know enough about the Bible. You know, the, the book of Romans again, Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. At best, the law is just going to point out that you're a sinner. Knowing the law means there's enough of the truth in you to make you aware that you're not perfect, that you're not sinless. 
And if you claim that you are sinless, that you do, you, there's, the truth is just not there. It's not in you. The truth is, if you knew the law of God, the law of God is, is high and holy. And it makes demands upon us that I can't, I can't always say I, I measure completely up to the standard And so I know there is failure and there is weakness on my part. There is the knowledge of sin. And if I said I had no sin, then that would just be a confession that I just don't know what God's book demands then. The truth is not in us. Romans chapter 5 verse 13 says, Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And his point is, everybody sins. So sin is imputed. There is some kind of law. And a person begins to realize his inadequacies and his shortcomings. When he looks in the law of God and he sees in the law of God the glory of God and the holiness of God. And he sees himself as weak. Romans 3 verse 19 says, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, why? That every mouth may be stopped. John is hoping that some of these brethren knew enough about it that it stopped their mouths from saying such a thing as we have no sin. Every mouth should be stopped when the law of God is reflected upon and compared to our lives, we see sin. We see that we fall short of the glory of God. In James chapter 2, let's just suppose, James said, let's just suppose you, you do everything the law says, but you offend in one point. Can you say, I have no sin because I... I do nine-tenths of the things that it demands. I, or I do 99% of it. No, that 1%, whatever it might be. James says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. He's broken the law of God. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So, you cannot say, I have no sin. Here's something that always challenges. What about the first two? The two primary ones. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's a challenge. Can I say, I love the Lord my God with all of my heart, with all of my strength, that I can't do any better in that regard than I've done in the past, that I'm doing it just right. It would be pretty, pretty tough to lay claim on that. And what about loving your neighbor as yourself? Can you lay claim that I love my neighbor just like I love myself? I care about them just like I do me. That was a challenging command. It would be hard for us to say, I do that perfectly. So more than likely, if we look closely at the law of God and what it demands of us, And we look fairly and honestly at ourselves. We've got to see that there's work to do. That there's always room for improvement. At the very least we can say, I'm not where I ought to be yet. I've got to keep striving and get better. But you can't say, I have no sin. Because that would be self-deception. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, 
if we confess our sins, now that's a different that matter. And not by confessing, I'm not just saying I admit that I sin and I'm going to keep on doing this. Confession means that I'm sorry. It includes the idea of godly sorrow. And so one is confessing sins in a godly manner, humble before God, appealing for mercy. That's the idea of confessing sins. And if we do that... That doesn't mean I earn anything, but He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's that's doable. I like that program because that works. That means I'm not going to just keep walk around continuing in the practice of sin and being content to practice that. I'm not going to be content with myself. Practicing sin. And I'm not going to lower God's standard down to my my standard and say, that's what God ought to have expected anyway. He said his standard's too high. You see, those are kinds of ideas. Maybe we might not voice them, but in attitude and action, we may practice like we believe that. So we can't really say that. All right, so let's go to the next one. The third statement. It's very similar, but he says in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned. Now, one is in the present tense. I have presently no sin. And one speaks in regard to the past. I have not sinned in the past. So either way you want to look at it, if you said either of those things, you're wrong. You've deceived yourself. If we, have, if we say that we have not sinned, listen, the action is sinful in and of itself because we make him a liar. We make God a liar. God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we say we have not sinned. I have not sinned. If you say that, you make him a liar, and the, his word is not in us. So we've spent just a moment of time, and we've reflected on that, and we said, that's surely nothing that I want to say, because that really just doesn't line up with my actions. I know my actions don't line up with the idea that I have not sinned. Then in chapter 2, we see another statement. In chapter 2, verse 4 this time, I want you to notice that he writes, He who says, I know him. I know God. The idea of knowing God means that you've developed a familiarity, a close familiarity. In fact, it's, it's, it's... it's a statement like, very similar to like, a, I know my wife. I know her. And in this sense, and we're not talking anything other than knowing the person inside. Now, Jeremiah had prophesied in Jeremiah 31, verse 31. He says, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, they broke my covenant. I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. Now, Brethren, when you hear a brother in Christ say that we're not under any kind of law, that person doesn't know what he's talking about. God says, I'm going to put my law in their minds. What? This is talking about the age of the church, the age of Christianity, the age of Christ. I will put my law in their minds. And write it, my law, on their hearts. 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. These are people who are very, very much interested in the law of God. They don't dismiss it. They believe in it. But then notice the next thing he says. He says, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. See, what happened in Israel is that you were first given the sign of circumcision. The males were at uh, at eight days old. And then as they grew up, they were taught by the family, you need to know the Lord. He says, it's not going to be that way in this covenant. You're not going to get into the covenant and then start learning about the Lord. What you're going to do first is you're going to know the Lord. He says, for you are not going to do, you're not going to say, know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Tying forgiveness and knowing the Lord together, what you find is that somebody becomes familiar enough with the Lord that he understands he needs forgiveness of his sins. And he comes to appreciate and know that the Lord offers that forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Now notice the profession now in 1 John is that a person might say, I know him. But then what? He does not keep his commandments. That doesn't go together. You see, because you put the law of God in your heart and you know the Lord and you know what the Lord expects of you. And you know that he does not allow you to just pick and choose which parts you're going to practice and which parts you're not going to practice. When you say, I know him, John says, then what has got to to happen is there's got to be a deep appreciation for his commandments. He'll say later on that knowing the Lord and Keeping his commandments is not a heavy burden either because knowing the Lord helps you keep those commandments. The idea of keeping his commandments is not a demand. It's not saying that you've got, I'm telling you, you've got to keep them perfectly because if he says we, if we say we have no sin. But what we are saying is that the idea of keeping something is that you treasure and protect it. You value it. When you keep your household, you protect them, you value them, and you examine yourself by them because that's the the idea of keeping it. It's not necessarily the idea that you've you've got to always keep it perfectly before God will accept you. No, He pardons you and He provides forgiveness of sins. But you've got to value his word and keep coming back to it and comparing your life by it. So a person can't say, oh, I know him, and then doesn't keep his commandments. And what he says is the problem here is this person is lying. He may be first lying to himself, but he's lying. And he's lying to others when he says he knows God. And then he, he sets some kind of distance between himself and keeping God's commandments. It troubles me to hear brethren say such things as, well, that's legalism. I mean, you're just a legalist. What, what, what do you mean? You don't have to keep his commandments? And when you get right down to it, tell me one commandment you don't have to keep. I can't name one. I can't name one and say, I don't have to keep that. We can't do that with God's law. We're lying to ourselves and we're lying to others. The truth is not in us. To keep means to hold it in great respect and that we, I'm not going to ignore His commandments. The test case. God says something about modest clothing. Do we ignore that? I, I, I'll do everything else, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to keep His commandments in regard to modest dress. You know, that tell, that's a person who says, I know God, but I'm going to ignore what He says right over here. 
You can't ignore anything God says. You can't. Ignore anything He says, set it on the back burner and say, well, I've got to do this right now. (laughs) You don't. You cannot claim that you know God and then you just make it a habit (laughs) that I'm I'm just going to ignore that command. Can't do it, brethren. So there's got to be a lining up between the fact that we say that we know God and that we have partnership with Him and we appreciate whatever He says on any topic. But if that's not the case, then we may be lying to ourselves. In chapter 2, verse 6, he who says he abides in him. You see, there's a, there's a difference between starting off and entering into Christ. And you do that at baptism when you confess your faith in Jesus. And, and you determine to repent of sins. And you're buried with him in baptism. And you rise to walk in newness of life. You have now entered into him. The proposition now becomes, are you going to stay in him? And if you say, I abide in him. I'm staying. I'm staying right where I need to be in Jesus Christ. But notice the next statement here. We've got to line up. We've got to line up the profession, what we say, and what is done. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. What was that? You cannot say, I'm I'm abiding in Christ. And then you don't have the same attitude toward the Word of God that Jesus had. Jesus said, my, I'm, my bread is to do the will of Him. My whole life is about doing the will of Him who sent me. That's the way Jesus walked. And that's the way He expects us to walk. And the idea then is that Jesus walked continually with His God. It wasn't... Uh, on again and off again. He walked continually with God. So walking continually with God doesn't mean in our case, it was in his case, but it's not in our case, that somewhere along the line I can say I have no sin. Now I can still walk with God and admit that I fall short in ways and I'm going to do better. And I'm going to confess it and I'm going to work on that. But the idea is, the reason I'm going to keep doing that is because I respect the will of God. And that's what my life is going to be about. And when corrections need to be made, I'm going to be humble enough to admit that I need to make improvements right there. Because that's what walking with God demands. It's not going to be the case that I can walk this way for a week and then next week I'm, I'm off again. You see, he walked continually and steadily with his relationship with God. And this notice also verse 9. He who says, he is in the light. I'm in the light. You profess to be in the light, but you hate your brother. Could it be the case? That we can say, I'm in the light, but I hate my brother. And his point is, those two things, the claim and the action, do not line up. So the problem is that the darkness, some kind of bitterness, something has, has taken over the mind He says he is in darkness until now. It just doesn't work that you can walk in the light and hate your brother. It doesn't work that way. And he says this again later on. Chapter 4 is the final one. If someone says, I love God, and God sees you hate your brother... And God says, prove it. Prove it 
by loving your brethren. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. First of all, he's lied to himself. And then he explains, verse 20, chapter 4, For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen. And keep in mind that your brother is made in the image of God. And God says, anybody that's made in the image of God is somebody you are supposed to love. Have goodwill for that person. All right, so you haven't seen me. You've just seen those that are made in my image. You know that they weren't here by accident, so you know they reflect a little image of me. And you want to say that you love God, but you hate your brother. Can you thumb through your file cabinets of your memory, of your mind, think of a brother? And you just hate him. You hate that brother. Well, he says, if that's the case, you can't say you love God. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? It's one of the most powerful, powerful self-examining passages in the Bible. And every one of us has to reflect on that. We have to reflect on is, is our claim that we love God matching up with our actions. Because if they're not, we're lying to ourselves. We cannot truly love God and hate our brother. Now, so what have we learned? We've learned this. That self-deception has always been very easy. It's happened from the very beginning. It's easy to deceive ourselves, to trick ourselves. We don't need to be be very uh, careless and indifferent about that. We've got to look at that and say, fellowship with God demands something. Transforming, something that transforms me, keeps me looking. I can't just claim that I believe. Faith only and proclamation only has never been enough. Never and never will be. We need to be people who are transformed. We're being transformed as we read in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. We're being transformed from one glory, stage of glory to the next. We're in progression. We're always in progression. Getting better. Getting stronger. Doing better. Reflecting on such truths as we've mentioned tonight. We need to shape and measure our lives by the will of God because it's in us. And because His seed is in us, it's causing us to be transformed people. We never can stay the same. Never. And our conclusion then is that that's got to be the case of those brethren in the first century He says, you've got to lock yourself into that relationship with God. It's got to be a walk with God. It's got to be a partnership with God. Now, how do you begin fellowship with God? In every case of conversion that I can see in the New Testament, it starts with hearing the truth. That's why Jeremiah had talked about he had put his word in your heart. Well, hearing the truth is God's way of putting his truth and writing it in your heart. You got to hear it. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 17. And Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Believing is essential. After you hear the gospel, and the gospel is God's way of writing His law in your heart, and you believe it, and you repent of sin. You say, I was thinking the wrong way. I was living the wrong way. I'm going to turn that around. That's what repentance means. Just turn it around. Turn around the direction you're taking in life. Confessing, that's not, a, that's not an impossible thing once you believe in Jesus. That ought to be something that's empowering. That, that you ought to be able to say, I believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And we ought to be buried with Him in baptism. Baptism. 
so that we can have our sins cut off by His grace and by His mercy and establish that fellowship. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, and if we can assist you in that tonight and you know what you need to do, and God has written that in your heart and you understand it, we can help you with that. Please come now as we stand together and sing this song.